Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for, for attending this presentation. The topic is seismic embankment, abutment structural interaction of integral abutment bridges. And it's a research project done in collaboration with Professors Carlos Ventura and Liam Finn from UBC. Well, integral abutment bridges are single or multi-span structures with a continuous concrete deck and cast integral with the abutment. Uh, these structures have become a, co a cost efficient solution for highways agencies because of the lower maintenance costs associated with the elimination of deck joints and expansion bearings. So in order to accommodate the expansion and contraction of the deck, the abutments are supported on uh, flexible foundations, which is usually consists of a, a one row of edge piles. For the very stiff soil conditions like cyclas A, B, and C, the abutment can be extended and supported on a spread footings, uh, taking care of the proper connection between the abutment and the footing to behave as a hinge connection. So it can allow the expansion and construction of the deck without attracting too much uh, shear forces and bending moments. Uh, this is the video on the left shows an animation of the seismic response of one of the uh, one of these bridges. Uh, is done using elastic analysis. Uh, the response is modeled in the longitudinal direction of the bridge. Um, the figure on the side represents the fundamental mode shape of vibration of that bridge. So by checking by comparing two, the two uh, the two videos you can see that the response is, that the seismic response of the bridge uh, is strongly controlled by the fundamental mode shape of vibration of the system. The fundamental mode shape is basically the signature of the seismic response of a dynamic system. So the reason why there is this coupling in the response between the bridge structure and the embankment is because there are no deck joints or expansion bearing. So there is a full interaction between the two components. So these are some of the uh, uh, features of integral abutment bridges. I'm going to focus on the last two ones. So analytical studies and strong motion earthquake data on instrumented bridges have shown that the seismic response of the approach embankments affect the seismic response of the bridge structure. However, current design procedures ignore the, the seismic response of the approach embankments. And maybe the reason for this is because it's difficult to couple or to model the semi uh, to model the approach embankment uh, in a structural model, which is usually the way these ana bridges are analyzed, right? So, in, uh, the the most common uh, structural model used in design is what is called response spectrum analysis. Uh, in this type of models the interaction with the uh, approach embankments and the soil piles is replaced with soil spring using PY springs or the, or the abandonment backfill springs. Uh, this type of analysis only considered kinematic interactions. The approach embankments are not considered in the response of, of, the, of the system. But this analysis is very popular. I would say 90% of the bridges are designed with this uh, for the structural engineers. The second type of analysis is using time history analysis with 2D continuous models. So these are the models that we build in Plaxis, Flax, Abacus, etc. In these models, we do take into account the seismic response of the approach embankments. However, as you know, it's not, it's, these, are not, these models are time consuming. The geotechnical engineer has to be in very close interaction with the structural engineer to properly calibrate the, the models and the post-processing of the data is very time consuming. So unless we have a, a, a generous budget, this type of analysis are not usually done. So there is the lack of, of a proper model for the structural engineers. So this is the terminology about uh, this type of bridges. Is the same terminology include in the Canadian Harbor Bridge Code, uh, in which uh, we separate the, the bridge in three components, basically. One is the bridge structure. The second one is called the near fill, which take into account the abutment backfill interaction and also the, the piles uh, interaction. And the last one is the approach embankment uh, or the free fill response. Uh, the code call it far field that was adopted from, from Caltrans. So 
Uh, this is a representation of the two mode shapes of vibration of an integral abutment bridge, in this case, uh, using elastic analysis. Response spectrum analysis are basically elastic analysis. So you see in the, in the upper figure, the first mode of vibration, which in this case represents the motion of the bridge structure and the near field. Do you see those red points at the back that say far field? Those points show that in this photo vibration, the far field is not moving, the approaching backbend is not moving. And the figure uh, uh, below is the second mode shadow of vibration in which now we see the motion of the, of the approaching backbends in the far field and how they affect the response of the bridge. So mode shapes and the associated periods of vibrations are the signature of the seismic response of a structure. The final response in a time history analysis or even in a response spectrum analysis is the sum of the contribution of all these modes depending on the mass participation. This is a, a so we, we carry out several uh, analyses using this 2D continuous model using elastic analysis. What we see is the red line here, this, this figure represents the relative displacements of the bridge deck. And the relative displacement is very important because it controls the seismic demands in the structure, pending moment, shear forces, etc. The, 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 the red line represents the relative displacement of the approaching backman in the far field. So by far field means it's not affected by the response of the bridge structure. And the black line represents the relative displacements of the, of the deck. So as you can see for this case, which is a short bridge with embankments that have 160 meters per second of, of shear wave velocity, we see that the response of the bridge deck is strongly controlled by the far field of the approaching embankments, right? And that is, the, the easy way to determine that is by seeing the periods of vibration of each component. That period of vibration that say T structure 0 0.26 seconds, that is the period of vibration of only the structure, no interaction with the soil. The second one, 0 0.12, is the structure with interaction with the near field, is the model that is used right now in the structural analysis. And the last period is the period of vibration of the, of the approaching backments in the far field. So what you see is that the period of vibration of the signal that it was identified in the deck is pretty much the period of vibration of the far field. So in this case, the response is strongly controlled by the approach embankment. This is the same bridge, but that, this is the same approach embankment, but we increase the length of the bridge deck. And now the approach embankment and the, and the bridge are moving out of motion. And the period of vibration of the signal of the deck is controlled by the structure and the near field. That is what is considered in practice uh, right now. And in this case, it's a different bridge with a different embankment in, in terms of shear wave velocity. And now we see that the two bridges are moving again, that the bridge and the, and the um, embankments are moving in phase. And the reason for that is that the period of vibration of the embankments is the same as the period of vibration of the bridge. So they move in phase. And the final result is that they behave like if there was no interaction between both of them. So a different, a different case. So as you can see, the, the response of these bridges is quite complex because of that, because that interaction with the approach embankment and, and cannot be simplified only by, by uh, uh, a model ignoring the approach embankment. So what we did was to develop a simple, very simple dynamic model for the structural engineers so they can consider this embankment abandonment interaction. And the model consists of three components. The, the single degree of freedom in the center represents the structure, which has mass and stiffness. The mass is basically the mass of the bridge deck, and the stiffness is given by the, by the, by the piers and the bends and foundations. The near field stiffness, we take into account the interaction of the abutment with the backfield and the, also the piles. And the far field, which is Approach embankments are three-dimensional structures. We has a different shear wave velocities, and it, as you know, it's a complex behavior. We replace all that three-dimensional structure for, a very, for a just one single degree of freedom. So this is the simplest dynamic model. From a dynamic point of view, this is probably the simplest model. So this is an animation of how the how the model will behave using time history analysis. The figure, the video on the left represents a short bridge. When you see that the motion of the bridge is in phase with the approaching backments. 
and the video on the right represents a longer bridge in which now the bridge is moving out of phase with respect to the approach embankment. But there is a contribution of the response of the embankment in the response of the bridge. But the model cap captured what we saw with those mode shapes using 2D continuous model. So uh, in order to understand, because what, 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 when, we do, when we model 2D continuous models, like in FLAC or PLAXIS, the, the, the thing is it becomes like a black box. You, you put everything, you check it, you get results, but it's difficult to understand what, what really is controlling what. So that is why the importance of separating things in simple ways so we can understand what is controlling what and when it's important. So this is a sensitivity analysis that was done in which we compare the response, ignoring the response of the embankments, so how it's done right now in practice in the, for the structural design versus the figure below, the proposed uh, model. So uh, uh, this is one of the cases. There was a large database of analysis that were carried out and this is one of the cases. So for one, for, for one type of approach embankment for the shear wave velocity. So the figure on the left shows the relative displacement of the deck. The squares, the, the black squares, represent the response obtained with a 2D continuum model. In this case, it was with, with Abacus. The, the, the blue dots represent the response, ignoring the response of the approach embankments. And the green uh, uh, dots represent the response, in, including the embankment response with the proposed model. So from a... a uh, from the relative displacement point of view, we see that the proposed model captures very well the response obtained with the 2D continuum model. And the other uh, conclusion is that in this case for this bridge, ignoring the response of the approach embankment underestimate the relative displacement of the deck. That means we underestimate bending moment, shear force, etc. The figure on the right represents the, the abutment, the the force of the backfield against the abutment. So again, in this case, the, the ignoring the embankment response could, in some cases, underestimate or overestimate the response of the approach embankment, while the proposed model that includes the, the, the approach embankments captured relatively well the response of the 2D continuum model. That, that reduction in the approach embankment of 30 meters, approximately, that happens is because for this specific case of the approach embankments, the two models have the same period of vibration. We're moving almost the same peak displacement. So if they move the same, the interaction between both of them is very small. Not because that spring is, is, is softer or something else. It's just because there is no relative displacement between both of them. So that, is, that was captured with the model. So the, uh, uh, well, in order to, to understand what controls what, we carry out a parametric analysis with a large database in which we vary the period of vibration of the structure, the period of vibration of the near field, the period of vibration of the far field, sorry, the stiffness of the near field, and the period of vibration of the far field. And this, what this plot shows is the ratio of the relative displacement, including the embankment response, to that ignoring the embankment response. So, and the uh, uh, horizontal axis represents the ratio of the period of vibration of the, of the embankment to that of the bridge structure, including the near field. So, the way it's done in practice right now. So, what we see is that when those two periods are the same, there is a resonant effect. And we can have up to four times the relative displacement if we know the, the embankment response, or it could be negligible. And what is that difference between those two is the link connecting the two systems. And that link is the near, uh, near field stiffness. So for the case when we have a very weak link, it's called by the KR value of 0 0.1. That is just the ratio of the near field to the bridge structure. If we have a very weak link, uh, weak, uh, weak link, the conclusion is that it doesn't matter. The embankment response doesn't control the response. And it, and it makes sense. You have two systems vibrating with a link that is very weak, almost zero, they are basically isolated. So there is no response, that makes sense. The other case, the red line is what happened if that leak is very strong, now we have a strong effect of the response and that is amplified. That is the first part of the amplification. After that, there is a reduction. And eventually, when the period of the bridge structure is much greater than the period of the bridge, uh, sorry, 
when the period of the embankment is, is much longer than the period of the bridge structure, now we have again an amplification of those displacement. And that is what in the structural engineering, engineering is called the short column effect. So you have a system that have large displacements, right? Because the displacement increases with the period of vibration. You have a system we have a large displacement connected to a stiff system that have a small displacement through a very stiff noise. So what happened, this is going to push the short period column and increase the displacement. That is what, that is what happened in, in that, showing that plate. So showing this behavior in that way is a little more, more difficult to put in guidelines. So what we did is just to join everything in an index called the embankment abutment structure interaction index. And that index basically includes the stiffness of the near field, the, the period of vibration of the embankment, and the period of vibration of the, of the bridge. And in that representation, we pretty much see, see the same thing, right? So when the index is greater than 0.2, is when we can say that it's important to include the embankment in the response of the bridge is, is structure. That is the, the simplification. This has already been included in the commentary of the code, but it was not using the index, it was using the, the components. So the code says that if the, the stiffness ratio is greater than 40% and the pivot ratio is greater than 70%, embankment abutment interaction should be included. If you put those values in the EC index, is going to tell you that it's, it should be greater than 0.2. I think it's easier to put easy index instead of using the, the period of vibration. OK, so <clears throat> based on this, what we concluded here is, as you see, it's important to take into account the embankment abutment and structured interaction. It's, sorry, it's important to take into account the, the embankment interaction in the response of the bridge structure. However, that is not necessary for all the cases. It will depend on the index. So a uh, very important component here is the near field component or the abutment backfield interaction. So there are two types of, of, of abutment, what is called translational abutment and rotational abutment. So the translational abutment are those in which the displacement of the abutment is the same at the top and at the toe of the wall. That is the case, for instance, of a stoop abutment. And rotational abutments are in which the displacement at the toe is zero and maximum at the top. And that will be the case of full high rigid abutments, like the one that we saw the animation. So the way that, that those abutments uh, in, uh, mobilize the shear strains in the soil are completely different. Therefore, there was going to be a different uh, force displacement response curve. The video on the left shows a translational abutment. And you see the failure surface is the typical textbook example for passive failure. The figure on the right shows the rotational abutment in which the shear strain or the, or the, or the uh, passive failure is developed gradually from the top to the uh, toe of the, of the wall. So uh, there are two recommendations in the code about how to model that near field stiffness. The first one is using a linear analysis. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, and I'm going to focus on this one, which is the most common one uh, used, that is using a linear elastic perfectly plastic solid springs. There are some important considerations about these springs, is that those springs were taken from Caltrans, and that Caltrans was taken from a single field test done on a full scale, uh, the full scale in 2007, and that was done for an abutment that is 1.7 meters high. That backfill material is silty sand. It's not a bridge and field that we have here. It was silty sand. You see that it has a cohesive component. Second, it was in a static condition. And third, it was only for translation, right? And they pushed this abutment uh, on 50 millimeters. I remember from personal communication of Chance Abadi. At that time, it cost $1 million American dollars just to push that abutment uh, 50 millimeters. Uh, so this is the linear plastic. So the limitation of these ones are, is only for the static condition, only for translation, and is up to 1.7 meters high. If, if the abutment is greater than 1.7 uh, meters high, it's not included in the, in, the, in the commentary, but there is a good paper by San Chabadi that gives you those springs up to 2.5 meters high abutment using a hyperbolic soil model. But it's based on the same limitation that these are. So what we did is, for this symposium was to develop soil springs uh, for, for, for abutments, taking into in consideration a hyperbolic soil springs. So 
is, is, is a very simple model. It only has three parameters, right? The previous one has two parameters, that is stiffness and passive resistance. This has, has a stiffness, the same passive resistance, and it adds an additional pa a parameter that is called U50, which is the displacement to reduce the initial stiffness by 50%. So it's a, it's a, it's a simple parameter. Uh, this hyperbolic model is based you know, based on this mo in the hardening soil model uh, uh, included in, in numerical model. So we carry out a series of pushover analysis, both for translation and rotation, and also include a pseudo-static analysis to include the, the mobilization of the seismic response of the embankment. And the figure below shows the shear planes, uh, the shear strain plane, which shows that for the translation is the, the failure start from the bottom and for the rotation is a start from the top. In this case, the model, we use the small strain hardening soil model, and there is a good paper by Brian Kreff that uh, gives us a correlation, the parameters of the model uh, based on the relative density. In this case, it was 95%, what we assume, which gives you like a friction angle of 40 degrees and 10 degrees. So I would say this is probably conservative for, for the bridge and fields that we, that we use here. Uh, after we, we simulated that for a very large database, and for each type of abutment, we obtained the response from Plaxis. We could feed it well with, uh, with, uh, with the hyperbolic model. And the two conclusions, the mainly two conclusions for that are first, that the rotational abutments mobilize the full passive resistance at much greater displacement than translational abutments, right? That's the first one. And the second, the passive resistance in a translational abutment is lower than the passive resistance in a translational environment. So this, this has important implications, especially for the static design, in which the thermal expansion, the, the calculation of the passive pressure due to thermal expansion of the deck, uh, has to be considered for the abutment design. And there is no uh, uh, a clear guideline about what should be that for several agencies says, oh, you should consider 50% of the passive resistance or the 100%. A lot of research has been done on that. But what we see here is for the rotational abutment is that probably you don't need even 50% for the static condition or even for breaking forces, right? Uh, so based on all that database, what we developed was an empirical correlation for those three parameters. And that empirical correlation, as you can see there for the three ones, is a function of the height of the abutment and also of the PGA. So the first part is a static value, and the second one is just a, a seismic reduction factor from one to whatever, 0 0.5. And it was done for translational abutments and also for rotational abutments. And we have already been using this in practice with uh, structural engineers. Uh, uh, so the final, con the final result of those models is that you can develop those force versus, so those force displacement curves very, very easily. For, for that one, in this case, the red line represents for the static condition, zero PGA, and the blue line represents for the PGA equal to 0.4G. So we see, what well, you see is that the seismic response reduces the passive resistance and also reduces the stiffness, which that is not included in the, in the model proposed uh, the, by, by Chan Sabadi. Uh, uh, so we use for the vessel displacement curve if the structural engineers need to do pushover analysis or time history analysis. And the figure on the right represents the secant stiffness, which we use it for response spectrum analysis. And the secant stiffness is just the, the first part of the equation. It's, it's relatively, relatively simple. Um, this shows uh, the difference. Uh, the, the figure shows on the left, uh, the vertical ordinate is the ratio of the displacement to mobilize the full passive resistance with respect to the height of the abutment, and uh, the uh, horizontal axis is the wall height. So, wall height. So, what, what you see here clearly is how much displacement is required for that for that rotational abutment, right? Is vary between 12 and 24 percent for the rotational abutment to mobilize the full passive resistance, while for that translational abutment is only between 1.2 and 3 percent. That is the average 2% value that, that is recommended in the Canadian Foundation Manual. So it's important to recognize the difference between, between those two. Okay, so my time is running out. I uh, wanna summarize that the, the, the distribution of the air pressure is also different. In a translational abutment, increase it with depth. 
in a rotational abutment is maximum at the top, at zero at the bottom, and it increases with depth as we will push the bridge uh, longer. And the final one, I'm going to leave the slide there, all the questions, but I'm just going to say that the, 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 the most important part of this is how to model the embankment. So we have in the embankment a three-dimensional structure that we have to convert into a one single degree of freedom. So one single degree of freedom represents mass, stiffness, and also damping. So those are the expressions to calculate uh, those expressions, uh, to calculate each component. And this uh, model includes uh, the two-dimensional effects, that is the factor F2T, include the two-dimensional effect in the reduction of the period. Uh, is based on the equivalent linear properties on the embankment. There is already a procedure for that. And it's also taking into account the dissipation, the radiation damping when the seismic wave goes to the abutment and are reflected. That is the F21. And the, sorry, that is the F uh, gamma uh, alpha value there. And the F2C is also the amplification of the response of the embankment. So this